The Star League in the 28th century was a tale of two halves, one public and one hidden. Outwardly, it was stronger and more advanced than ever before, a place where the average citizen enjoyed a quality of life that has not been matched in over 250 years. Behind the scenes, the cracks that had first appeared at the end of the good years had grown into even greater divides that threatened to become fissures into which the entire league would crumble. The origins of the Second Hidden War stemmed from the marriage of two individuals on February 20th, 2700, Mary Davian, the first prince's eldest child, and Soto Kirita, brother to the coordinator Takiro. Mary's decision threatened the Davian family and the security of the Federated Sons, so she was talked into signing the Act of Succession, which surrendered her rights and the rights of her children to the throne of New Avalon. However, upon Mary's death on September 18th, 2715, her eldest son Vincent came forward to proclaim himself as the next First Prince. Takiro Kirita supported his claims and sent emissaries to Mary's brother, the now First Prince Joseph Davian. Joseph dismissed the Kiritan suggestions out of hand and instead named his son Richard as his heir as he had always planned. Rather than rage or attack, Takiro took the matter to the High Council, producing evidence that Mary was coerced into signing the Act of Succession. In response, Jonathan Cameron formed the Davian Succession Board to resolve the issue. This might have been the end of it were it not for the coordinator's nephew, Riki Kirita, Keeper of the House Honor, whose interpretations of the sacred dictum honorium which guides Kirita's society led to Kiro to believe that action was both right and honorable. And so, he began making preparations. The Second Hidden War, better known as the War of Davian Succession, was about to kick off all along the Draconis Fed Sun's border. Going into 2725, things were quiet despite the tension. Jonathan Cameron had declared that until the Davian Succession Board reached a conclusion, in the event of an unexpected or sudden death for the First Prince, the Curita claim would be immediately dismissed. The Davians considered this enough security to deter an aggressive move on the part of their rivals. But some within the SLDF could see the writing on the wall, however. Vice Admiral Norumboli saw the war was imminent and was spending his time identifying which of the various units that were slowly manoeuvring towards the front would soon be crossing the border. Unfortunately, no one acted on what would in time prove to be his almost prophetic predictions. By April 2725, Takiro Kurita had run out of patience and launched the invasion that he had been planning for the last decade. The unimaginatively named Task Force Samurai would lead the campaign. This ad hoc division consisted of the 11th and 14th Benjamin Regulars, the 1st and 8th Galadon Regulars, the former of which brought with them their full brigade of infantry and armor support, and the 4th Sword of Light Brigade, which was also a combined arms unit. On the 16th of April, they descended en masse onto Marduk, and by May 24th had overwhelmed the defending 1st Evelyn Hussars, who retreated off-world. They began construction of a major staging post that would act as a springboard to future planetary invasions. From here though, things would become more challenging as the element of surprise had been lost. Over the next three weeks, the regiments of Task Force Samurai split up and moved on to their individual targets. The regulars headed for the lightly defended planets Dobson, New Iverson and Royal, while the 4th Sword of Light Brigade departed for a confrontation on Breed. The AWFS commander for this region of the Draconis March was General Lorne Kessam, and when word reached him of the attack, he hastily sprang into action. He had no way of knowing where the DCMS would strike next, but he correctly wagered that an offensive of his own would force them to divert troops for the defence of their own realm. With that in mind, he led the 3rd Davian Guards across the border to Ludwig, arriving around the same time that the Combine Regulars were making landfall behind him. Other AWFS units followed Kesem's example beginning on August 8th. The 14th and 16th Avalon Hussars, plus the 1st Robinson Chevaliers, moved against Hamam, Junction and Donanak respectively. But without the years of planning that the Curitan units had, their effectiveness was limited. By year's end, the war had spread to nine worlds. Royal had fallen to the Combine, and Breed might have done the same were it not for the timely arrival of the 4th Davian Guards. Nevertheless, they faced an uphill struggle against the larger Sword of Light Brigade. The AWFS scored their first victory in early 2726 on Hamam, but their compatriots were having a tougher time of it against the disciplined Benjamin regulars. More bad news came on April 18th with the defeat of the 4th Davian Guards and the loss of Breed. The unit had almost been destroyed, but had inflicted a heavy toll on the 10th Sword of Light Regiment. Their sister sword regiments did not long delay before departing again, the 11th arriving on Clathandu by the 5th of June. When reinforcements began arriving at Donanak and Junction, the entire Davian front looked in danger of collapse. By this point, most of the AWFS expeditionary force was cut off and without means of escape. 
but on June 24th, a timely victory for General Kessem at Ludwig finally seemed to stem the flow and force the DCMS to respond. The assault on Dobson had been the least successful of all the Task Force Samurai targets, so the DCMS cut their losses and withdrew to Breed to reinforce the ruined 10th Sword of Light. While the Battlemech Regiment would remain here, the rest of the Brigade departed for Ludwig in the hopes of retaking their world. Even still, the Combine advance had only slowed, not stopped. Within the week, they had successfully captured New Iverson, and the 12th Sword of Light was reaching Clovis for the next planetary invasion. The 3rd Galadin regulars had also left their homeworld of Lima on July 1st and headed for Davian space. Nevertheless, Kesem's tactic had proven at least partially successful, and similar attacks were soon underway. One of their main targets was the world of Proserpina, defended at this time by most of the Hussars Brigade. The 14th Avalon were already underway from Hammam, leaving behind them an occupation force of conventional armour, but fresh troops were dispatched as well in the form of the 7th Robertson Chevaliers. While underway, the 3rd Galadin reached Lucerne, and another planet was engulfed in war. The many regiments of the Proserpina Hussars proved a formidable challenge for the invading AWS, and casualties on both sides quickly ramped up. Unfortunately, what they had hoped to see in the Draconis forces returning was failing to materialise. Only the 1st Galadin Regulars Brigade, and even then not all of them, launched their counterattack on Ludwig on October 15th. A Davian deep strike was launched as a last-ditch attempt to draw the invading forces back when the 7th Tank Ready Loyalists set up operations on Annapolis, and from there struck out at surrounding worlds, including the district capital of Benjamin. They would continue these strikes throughout the war. The Davian War of Succession had been raging for almost two years by this point, and the SLDF had made themselves scarce. Jonathan Cameron, ever troubled by visions of the collapse of the Star League, ordered his troops to fortify the border of the Terran hegemony, terrified that the fighting would spill over. Despite easily having the strength to put a stop to the fighting, he was paralysed by his fear. This was not true for everyone within the SLDF, however. Two years prior, work was completed on one of the most advanced military projects to come out of the Star League, the Nighthawk Powered Armour. Its combat debut had come in early 2725, and a few months later, the SAS Blackheart secretly deployed a force to Marduk and began a live fire exercise in which they repeatedly eliminated the DCMS officers without being discovered. They would later play a part in determining the best targets to end hostilities towards the war's conclusion. Both sides remained unaware of their involvement until decades later. Three offensives came to an unsuccessful end in early 2727. The first was the defeat of the 16th Avalon Hussars at Junction in January. They withdrew to Ludwig to help General Kessem hold that world. In February, the Combine called off their brief attack on Lucerne and headed instead for Royal, recognising it as a likely target for counterattack. The invasion of Proserpina also drew to a close, the retreating Davian forces having sustained losses of more than a third of their unit. They regrouped at Sheet, back across the border. The First Prince had been busy mobilising a large force that he planned to use to not only fight off the invaders, but ultimately lead a major counter-invasion of the Draconis Combine. The Crucis army began life on February 24th with only two battlemain regiments, the 4th Den of Light Cavalry and the 4th Robinson Chevaliers, but other units were mustering and would soon join with them. The 5th Robinson Rangers, having seen to the defence of Lucerne, was now counter-attacking New Iverson. Joseph Davian made this his first target for the Crucis army, and departed in April. While en route, Clovis fell to the 12th Sword of Light in May. Despite the numbers' advantage, it took until October 28th to force the remaining battalion of Galadin regulars to withdraw from New Iverson back to Lima. The attention of both sides now turned towards Royal, which looked as if it would be the largest battle yet. The 6th Benjamin regulars left their sister regiment in Donanac to finish off the wounded Robinson Chevaliers, who were operating at just 40%, while they departed to reinforce the other DCMS units on Royal. The 14th Benjamin and 3rd Galadin could only muster one regiment in strength between them, having taken 30-60% to 60 casualties in their earlier engagements. The battle for this world kicked off on August 5th, 2728, with the arrival of the First Prince and the Crucis army. Their relative parity in numbers meant that neither side could win anything more than minor victories, and soon both were entrenched. Aid came a few months later when General Kessem abandoned his hold over Ludwig to the Galadin regulars' conventional forces, and moved to reinforce Joseph Davian in May. Meanwhile, the Combine was still looking at other offensives. Their first stab at Clothandu had failed, the various regiments of the 4th Lord of Light had since regrouped on Breed, but now they were tried again with the 9th Proserpina Hussars. The AWFS regiments recuperating on Sheet had since moved to defend the planet, and now hoped they'd have better luck against the individual Proserpina units compared to the full brigade they'd faced earlier in the war. Not long after, Curitan reinforcements arrived in the form of the 4th Galadin. 
the 5th province of Rangers pursued the remaining battalion of 8th Galadin regulars back to Lima, but also broke off a detachment to move against the weakly defended Wapakoneta. And finally for 2728, after three years of brutal combat, Admiral Smithwick was able to enter the Donanak system at a pirate point, and rescue what few companies of the first Robinson Chevaliers were still standing. In the new year, an emergency war summit was organised on Dahar in the hopes that more AWFS forces could be brought to bear, but tragedy struck almost immediately when Duke Stephen Hassock was killed in a dropship accident upon his arrival. This scuppered any hope of quick reinforcement for the Capellan March. The Davian Heavy Guards assaulted Colchester and won a victory for the Federated Sons later that autumn. In one day, they reduced the 5th Benjamin regulars to less than 50% strength with the loss of only a quarter of their unit. A quick encirclement forced the Cretans to surrender. 2729 was the year where the chaos that had engulfed the Davian Cretan border started to spread across the inner sphere. A minor example of this was an opportunistic raid on Mira by a small DCMS force looking to rearm, but these were quickly defeated by the 3rd Chesterton Cavalry. Things were far worse on Earth. Jonathan Cameron's troubled mind had begun to seriously affect his running of the Terran hegemony in the Star League. The war between two of its most powerful members and the First Lord's complete lack of action to resolve it pushed some of his most senior staff to act against him. On May 13th, Commanding General Ikolov Fridasa, BSLA Commander Gregory Wallace, and Revenue Director Bryce Hinchcliffe IV approached Jonathan's pious sister, the mother Jocasta Cameron, and presented her with evidence of her brother's illness, urging her to take the reins. Jocasta though was unmoved, and declared that she belonged at her Scottish convent and not at Unity City. This was not the answer the three conspirators had been hoping for, but undeterred, they began to spread rumours that Jocasta was plotting a coup against Jonathan, in the hopes that more would flock to her side and force her hand. The Reverend Mother was abhorred when she discovered this, and went straight to the First Lord. The trio soon found themselves convicted of treason, and condemned to death on the 2nd of August, but their actions had nonetheless brought about their goals. In the aftermath, the two siblings realised how bad the situation had become, and agreed to rule in unison as of August 19th, 2729. One of their first appointments was the new commanding general, Rebecca Fetladrill. She took office on September 13th, and began planning the SLDF intervention, codenamed Operation Smother. Unfortunately, this internal crisis had taken most of the year to resolve, and by this point, the battle on Royal was reaching a crescendo. It was a frenzy that would sadly cost First Prince Joseph Davian his life. His mech was incapacitated during the fighting on October 20th, after which the Curitan infantry swarmed over it, extracted Joseph from the cockpit, and then brutally beheaded him. Only the brave actions of Thomas Green Davian allowed the retreating AWFS forces to recover the prince's body before lifting off Weld to bolster the defence of Robinson. For his actions, Thomas was granted the position of regent for the Capellan March until the young Duchess Rita Hassett came of age. The Second Sword of Light arrived at Royal soon after, with plans to potentially strike at the Draconis March capital. When word of Joseph Davian's death spread, it was the killing blow for all other AWFS operations in the region. The Tancredi Loyalists, who had spent three years operating in Draconis Combine space, returned to the Federated Sons. Only the first Avalon Hussars, newly refitted after their defeat at Marduk some four years prior, and led by the Duke of Robinson, Vasily Sandoval, were able to continue with their counter-attack on Fallon, where a small detachment of the 4th Sword of Light Brigade was making an opportunistic strike far from the main body of the fighting. Operation Smother was launched on November 8th. Five SLDF divisions were mobilised and dispatched to the front lines, each targeting a different contested world, making landfall almost simultaneously. The 26th Graham and 39th Denabola Royal Battle Mech Divisions made landfall on Lima and Wapakoneta, whereafter the Robinson Rangers immediately suspended hostilities. Likewise, on Clothandu, the 159th Athena Royal Mechanised Infantry Division brought about a ceasefire without incident. The 4th Sword of Light Brigade attempted to contest Breed, but the 1st Jump Infantry Division, alongside supporting elements from the 21st Royal Jump Infantry Division, were able to force a surrender by December 16th. Lastly, the 160th Sirius Battlemate Division arrived on Royal alongside the 1st Avalon Hussars, and faced stronger opposition before finally concluding the contest there in early 2730. The Hussars then had been involved in both the opening and closing actions of the war. As an historical footnote, one of the descendants of the bodyguard that had lost her life protecting Nicholas Cameron from the mad Lena Curita some 100 years prior, saw his first action at Royal, a young Alexander Kerensky. When his regiment's entire command staff was wiped out during landing, his quick actions saved the unit and began a meteoric rise up the chain of command, becoming Fetladrill's aide and eventual successor in just 10 years. 
A decisive Jocasta Cameron now stepped forward to dictate terms. Her position as co-ruler had become official on December 29th. First of all, the Curita claim to the Davian throne was completely overruled. The evidence for Mary Davian's coercion that they had tried to present had been found to be falsified. All borders were reset to how they had been pre-war. But it was our next act that would have long-term negative repercussions for the Star League. She assigned blame to both sides for resolving the issue through conflict. Takiro Kirita was livid and his response was entirely predictable. The Draconis Combine, which had never been close participants in the Star League, withdrew in all but name. Ichiro Oshiro, Minister for the Department of Indoctrination, was tasked with taking every opportunity to subvert the Star League's popularity within the realm and was exceptionally successful at this. As an aside, Takiro reorganised the Sword of Light Brigade after the war on account of their mediocre performance. From then until now, the brigade would consist of five reinforced regiments, each based around one of the five pillars of the Draconis Combine society. But just because Kirita was angry didn't mean that young Fresh Prince Richard Davian was any happier with the outcome. The promises that Ian Cameron had made 150 years earlier about coming to their aid in the event of conflict had not been fulfilled. His father had been petitioning the Star League for assistance from the very first week and all throughout the war, but to no avail. Simply because their defensive strategy had involved counterattacks within the Draconis Combine, they were treated as a guilty party. In the aftermath, both nations made moves to isolate themselves politically and economically from the Star League. Beginning on November 26, 2730, the Fedsun's industrial base started to shift away from interstellar trade and towards self-sufficiency. On August 24, 2735, Richard Davian passed the Preparedness Act, which sought to create a vast militia force that could quickly mobilise at short notice in the case of future invasions from their neighbours. The AFFS had taken a huge hit to their credibility due to their inability to save the life of the First Prince, and now morale was at an all-time low. This poor state of affairs would continue for the better part of two decades, until in 2748, Colonel Mitchell Stopek of the 4th Davian Guards, one of the units whose reputation had been most tarnished, challenged the most recent winners of the Martial Olympiad's regimental tournament. The hard-fought victory that followed finally shook off the malaise, and Stopek, who had lost an eye in the engagement, was awarded the title of Prince's Champion. During this time, the AFFS had been undergoing an enormous arms build-up, manufacturing far more mechs and vehicles than they theoretically had the soldiers to crew. The Council Edict of 2650 only limited personnel, not materiel, and they took full advantage of this loophole, and nor were they the only ones working around the military restrictions. The Draconis Combine had found their loophole with the Ronin. The Capellans had raised dozens of Home Guard regiments outside the chain of command, reporting instead to the individual duchies and the Free Worlds had reduced their federal forces to all-time lows while continually growing their provincial ones. That was a decision that was about to lead to disaster.